Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here on a Sunday, spending time with us. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I am going to share with you some information regarding uh, the role of nutrition in IBD. Uh, just a little bit about myself, since I'm new to the group and haven't done a presentation before. I am a clinical dietitian, currently employed by Virginia Mason Franciscan Health. I do practice with a variety of different uh, populations, anything from general nutrition to diabetes, non-diet specific weight loss to elective surgical weight loss, like with our bariatric patients. But my particular interest and specialty area is with digestive dis uh, disorders. So that could be anything from IBD to um, gastroparesis, could be, uh, goodness, now I'm drawing a blank. Anything with digestive disease, uh, uh, focused on. So as a disclosure, anything that I discuss today is not intended to be a uh, uh, personal plan, so please remember that whatever we talk about today is for educational purposes for this presentation, and anything else should be discussed with your gastroenterologist or with your dietitian. So for today's discussion, uh, what I'm hoping that you will get out of this is, oh, Maybe I should stand here so that you can actually hear me, huh? So what I'm hoping that you'll get out of today is understanding more about uh, how IBD does impact nutrition, the risks and treatment of malnutrition, macro and micronutrient concerns as a result of IBD, Crohn's and colitis, and how does nutrition play a role in managing symptoms and managing the disease itself. So with IBD, we know that there's often struggles either with active or remissive IBD with patients struggling to get enough energy in, enough nutrients in. There also could be results of patients struggling with side effects of medications. There are nutrient losses as a result of uh, malabsorption, either from enteric losses due to inflammatory response within the small intestine with the ileum specifically being uh, affected with Crohn's. This could also be as a result of uh, a surgical uh, resection with patients who have had severe complications due to the IBD. So as a result, patients are also uh, often, often, patients are awesome, but patients are often uh, struggling with nutritional deficiencies. This could be protein intake, overall energy intake, which we're gonna see a downstream effect, often causing other deficiencies. Iron is very common, folic acid, B12 being linked together, uh, vitamin A, D, E, and K being our fat-soluble vitamins, often being common because of that chronic diarrhea loss. Zinc, magnesium, calcium, some of our electrolytes due to that frequent water loss with chronic diarrhea. Dehydration, again, frequent loss of water. We know that osteoporosis is a common risk because of the frequent intake of steroids. And then though I don't work specifically with a pediatric population, this is something that I'm often looking at with my adult patients. When were you diagnosed? Were you diagnosed as a ped? And did that disrupt your pubertal development? Was there a, a disruption in your velocity of your growth? So am I seeing you later in life? And do I need to take into consideration that your growth was impaired during your pediatric development as a result of nutritional deficiencies because of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. As a dietitian, when I'm seeing you for the first time and for follow-ups, many things that I'm taking into consideration are what are some of your pertinent medical history? Are there any other autoimmune conditions that I should be looking at that may also be affecting your dietitian or affecting your dietary intake? Are there other uh, histories of nutritional deficiencies that have been treated, are ongoing, that may not necessarily be related to Crohn's or colitis, that might be related to autoimmune deficiencies or other chronic health conditions? Because we know there are so many that are linked to one autoimmune condition being related to another. I'm also looking to see if there are pertinent medical histories related to, have you had DEXA scans? Are there bone density issues that I should be looking at? And are we taking care of that as far as medical supplementation? Uh, and then subjective, subjective patient history. This is where I'm listening to you. I'm wanting to hear what's going on with you at this time. Are you struggling with intake? 
What's going on with your weight? What's going on with your losses, with malabsorption? What are you struggling to do as far as weight is concerned? Or do you have a stable weight? Are you losing weight? How long has that weight loss been going on? And then that's where I start to key in with malnutrition. Has there been a weight change? How severe is that weight change? How long has that change been taking place? And then because of malnutrition, does that mean that you have body loss of, of fat or muscle? And are those things that we need to be concerned about repleting with dietary intake or other forms of nutrition? I'm also looking at biochemical data, so I'm looking at your labs. Are there nutrient deficiencies that we haven't addressed? So gastroenterologists are, are fantastic. Usually before you even get to me, they've done your labs. Many things that I can already assess. But often there are things that as a dietitian I'm looking at that maybe haven't been assessed. So maybe I'm looking at your zinc levels or your selenium that maybe thinking outside the box could be part of your symptoms that we should look at as well. If those labs haven't been done, I'm going to recommend that we rule some things out to see are there other causes for your symptoms. And then as a dietitian, part of my evaluation is I'm looking to see are there diagnostic tests that have been performed. Have you had CT scans, MRIs? Have there been bowel resections done? What part of the bowel has been resected? That's gonna tell me, where are you losing nutrients? What do I need to be focused on? Does the patient have a stoma and an ostomy? And what's the output of that ostomy? Is it something I need to consider more losses are happening because they're struggling with that particular information? So because malnutrition is not uncommon, it is part of my practice to make sure that we're focusing on, one, is the patient malnourished? And am I assessing that when I'm seeing that patient for the first time? It is more common among Crohn's patients than ulcerative colitis patients. And if we think about the true nature of Crohn's over colitis and how it affects the bowel, it does make sense to me that it would be more effective or more common in Crohn's patients because there is more of that bowel, that there is a risk of malabsorption, more areas of the bowel that we could see those losses. It is highest among those with active inflammatory bowel disease because if there's active inflammation, there's more risk that there's malabsorption of those enteric losses, more risk that, that chronic diarrhea is happening, could be blood loss that's causing iron deficiency, anemia. And then if there has been a surgical history, then again, is there a bowel resection where part of those nutrients are being lost and we need to consider that. And then for me as a dietitian, one of the areas that I'm always looking at, there continues to be a stigma with our overweight and our overbeast population. So often these patients are overlooked. They are not either properly assessed or they're under assessed. So sometimes, these patients aren't evaluated properly for malnutrition. So it may be presumed that they can't be malnourished, which is totally incorrect. It has absolutely nothing to do with the patient's body composition. So I'm always looking at all the same factors regardless of what you appear on the outside. So we need to evaluate everyone regardless of what they appear. So mechanisms of malnutrition can be quite cyclical. So someone may already be struggling with malnutrition simply because of their medication. So it could be taking medications that are making them quite nauseous, making them vomit, having a lot of abdominal pain, which is already causing poor energy intake. So that poor energy intake just from medications may already be leading them towards a risk of malnutrition. That then coupled with, are they in the hospital? In the hospital, they may have restrictive access to energy intake because they're being placed on no energy intake because they're having frequent diagnostics. So then we have even more decreased energy intake, so more risk of malnutrition. Is there prolonged hospitalization because they're having to have surgical procedures? Then we're looking at, because it's active inflammation, those enteric losses again, so more risk of malnutrition. Did they have to go through a surgery while they were in the hospital? If there's a surgery, there's a risk of bacterial overgrowth. That bacterial overgrowth increases that risk of motility. So now there's a risk of more loss from diarrhea. So electrolytes, fat-soluble vitamins. So it's constantly this cyclical, can't get off the hamster wheel, if you will, environment that can start just with medication. 
decreasing intake. So it's always my thought of where did this start on the cycle of the mechanism of malnutrition and where in the cycle of nutrition can I optimize your level of nutrition? Where can we help you get the most input to make sure that we're preventing you from being malnourished? So what are some of the common nutrient and deficiencies of concern? Iron is always at the top of my list because it's multifactorial. It could be due to those enteric losses. Again, with the ileum, the decreased uptake in the duodenum or the jejunum because of those losses from active inflammation. It could also be just from chronic losses of uh, blood loss from either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. It could also be due to poor intake. If you're not getting in enough energy from those iron-rich sources, you could be also be iron deficient. Vitamin D, also a concern, both from either losses of fat-soluble vitamins, or it could be because we are concerned of that osteoporosis risk factor because we know vitamin D is so vital for calcium and bone density. Zinc is one of our electrolytes, also incredibly important for wound healing and for our immune function. I'm usually more concerned about zinc with my patients who have an ostomy, especially with high, outpus, high output ostomy, but I'm just as concerned about my patients who haven't had a resection haven't had an ostomy placed, if there's chronic losses of fluids from diarrhea. Same is going to be true about selenium. Selenium is another one of those vital uh, nutrients that's important for the immune function. There's actually some research that indicates that deficiency of selenium may be uh, linked to risk of IBD, though that's controversial. We're not exactly sure if it's sort of a chicken or an egg scenario. So we know that selenium is really important to help with our microbiota. And selenium deficiency is really, really, really rare, but it can happen within the IBD community. Folic acid is one of our B vitamins. So vitamin B12, folic acid are linked together, absorbed in the ileum. So we know that this is really common with Crohn's over colitis. So definitely something I'm always looking at. And then, of course, calcium, because there's such a risk of osteoporosis with frequent steroid intake, I'm always looking to see what someone's calcium intake is and what their calcium levels are. So again, just to reiterate, this could either be due to limited or restricted intake, those enteric losses, blood loss, inflammation, hospitalization, surgery, etc. So what do we do about it? Do we just throw our hands up in the air and say, it's just IBD, there's nothing we can do? Of course not. I'm always fighting against IBD and saying there's always something that we can do. So I'm checking the assessment of those biochemical markers if they haven't been done. Usually they're going to be done yearly, but often I'm doing those more often, especially if I'm helping to replete those markers. So for example, if I see someone has iron deficiency anemia, they have low B12, they're deficient in vitamin D, I'm going to check those again in three to six months to see where you are when we're repleting those to make sure that things are returning to a baseline of where they should be. It's going to be a di bit different in each person depending on where you are on the active remissive cycle. Optimizing those nutrients. I've just put a few examples up here, calcium, electrolytes, B12, folate, some of the most common. And then considerations for supplementation. And the reason I say considerations I always want my IBD patients taking a multivitamin because we know how vital that is to get all of those nutrients and because there is such a difficulty with patients being able to get in enough nutrients consistently. That being said, do I ever want patients consistently taking all of these extra vitamins and minerals? It's difficult to say. Because if you're actively inflamed and you're struggling to get dietary intake, do I want to bombard you with a lot of other vitamins and minerals that are going to make you feel unwell? It's a really tricky balance for me, and it's in a gray area. So I have to really find out what your tolerance is of these. And it may be something where we tread lightly with liquid supplements to see how you're doing with those. And then we tread lightly to see what your values are to make it most effective so that you are at the greatest value of baseline levels. Because again, my benefit is always to make sure that you are at those proper nourished levels. Again, with patients who have those high output ostomies, I'm so incredibly concerned about hydration. 
Are you getting enough hydration? Are you able to take that in orally? Or do we need to work with your physicians to do something from IV fluids? With macronutrients, there's a lot of research that indicates that we need to increase protein requirements with patients who have IBD, specifically with Crohn's. There's not a lot of consensus regarding energy, meaning calories per day. However, as a dietitian, I take this individually with each patient. So depending where you are on the spectrum of malnourishment, I may need to also advocate for increased energy each day, not only protein. Promoting weight and muscle repletion definitely is going to be important to help with recovering from malnutrition and preventing further loss of muscle and weight. And then I may use internal nutrition in the setting of severe malnutrition. So if someone's inadequately taking in oral intake, they're malnourished, we can't utilize oral intake, then I'm definitely advocating for internal nutrition to prevent further malnourishment. Parenteral nutrition is something that I reserve only when patients cannot utilize the bowel, if there's bowel obstruction, if there's infection. So I always want to utilize the bowel when I can. So for active inflammatory responses, there's not one individual diet for IBD. And as Dr. Siskin mentioned, there's a lot of special interest in specific diets. So as he mentioned, the specific carbohydrate diet, the C-dead diet, there's also the low FODMAP diet some of you have may explored or heard of, just following gluten-free or paleolithic. There's a lot of lacking information in the adult population. What's really encouraging to me is what Dr. Siskin talked about today with some of the great latest research that's coming out about the specific carb versus Mediterranean um, or the EEN, which is not new, by the way. It's been with the pediatric population for quite some time, just lacking with the adult population. What's really promising to me is the specific carbohydrate versus the Mediterranean diet. I practice very much from that Mediterranean philosophy with my IBD patients. So it's very nice to see that there's literature finally coming out with the adult population that it's supported versus that specific carb diet. In my practice, I find the specific carbohydrate diet wonderful. It's just not incredibly sustainable. It's very hard to ask people to remove all those foods from their diet and continue to eat that way for a very long time. So with the exclusive inter enteral nutrition, as Dr. Suskin mentioned, it does promote that mucosal healing. It's not something that I practice a lot in my, um, not something that I advocate a lot for in my practice because it's really hard to follow through in the outpatient setting. It's much easier to do in the inpatient setting without with uh, adult populations. That being said, if we do this from an oral perspective, I find much better tolerance than from having to do this either from a nasogastric perspective. That being said, enteral nutrition should be utilized if oral intake is insufficient, and then parenteral nutrition should be utilized if there's a bowel obstruction, short bowel, or if we just can't use the bowel for any other purposes. So what else can we do if there's active IBD? If the patients can tolerate oral foods, I advocate that we do small meals more frequently. So the less energy that we're expending with eating and the less inflammatory response that we are advocating or the less uh, that we're encouraging from the bowel, the better your body's gonna tolerate food. We wanna focus on nutrient-dense, calorie-dense, vitamin-rich foods. And depending on where you are with weight, we also may wanna focus on very high-calorie, high-protein foods as well. Definitely want to focus on easier to digest soft foods and soluble fiber over insoluble fiber. So the difference there is going to be soluble fiber is that fiber that dissolves in water and forms a gel. So it's helping to slow digestion and decreases the risk of diarrhea versus insoluble fiber doesn't mix well with water, but it adds bulk to our stool. That being said, it does waste, it does uh, promote waste to the GI tract, which can exacerbate our diarrhea. So if we're focusing more on that soluble fiber, we're still able to get all of those vitamins and minerals that we need, but we can slow down the digestive tract. We definitely want to restrict high fat intake because that can exacerbate malabsorption. And then we're always wanting to replete losses of increased hydration that are being caused by uh, diarrhea. Limiting or avoiding caffeine, alcohol, refined sugars from processed foods, uh, carbohydrates from processed foods, and then greasy fatty foods are also going to help decrease the risk of that malabsorptive process. 
So what might that look like? So that could certainly be things from milk or milk substitutes. So it could be soft cheeses like cottage cheeses, although I would advocate for lactose-free. Some controversy there because not everyone is lactose intolerant, but there is uh, re enough research to indicate that when you have these active chronic losses, lactose sugar, because it's a high fermentable sugar, could exacerbate those losses. Hard cheeses, because they're lower in lactose. Yogurts, milks, or non-dairy milks. Animal proteins and seafood, so you could argue that these are the exact same thing. They're all animals, right? So salmon and tuna, things like shellfish, eggs, poultry, lean poultry, no skin on these poultries, lean ground beef, things like tofu or pureed beans. We want to puree the beans because if we're heating those in their whole form, it can be harder for the body to break down. The way I usually describe this to my patients in the clinic, anything that you can do to that food before you put it into your mouth as far as breaking it down is going to be way easier for your stomach and your small intestine to digest. So the more work you do before we enter it into the mouth, the easier it's going to be for your whole digestive tract to digest that food. Vegetables, we definitely want to focus on things that aren't going to be those high gas producing, high fermentable foods, but we want to focus on things that are very soft. So this could be canned foods, this could be frozen foods, it could be fresh, but making sure it's well cooked, steamed, roasted, but we want to peel foods. That insoluble fiber that's on the skin is going to be very difficult to break down for most of those vegetables and it's going to possibly increase the risk of diarrhea. So this could be things like potatoes or carrots, beets. Spinach is even fine, but we want to make sure that we remove the little um, stem. We don't want to risk that getting trapped anywhere in any ulcerations. Zucchini and squashes, the tip of asparagus, but not the stem. String beans, but making sure that you're stringing those beans. Acorn squash. Of course, this is not an exclusive list. Things like fruits without skins or seeds. So you could do things like banana, melon, papaya, pear, plum, peach, and grains. So this is right the opposite of what I'm normally advocating for my population of patients where, you know, normally you hear a dietitian say, oh, eat all your whole grains, right? But this is different when you're active. We want less fiber. So we want you doing very white fibers. White bread, sourdough bread, instant oatmeal over a steel-cut oatmeal, things like white pasta and white rice, cream of wheat, very soft, low-fiber cereals like rice checks or Cheerios, fortified cereals. And the reason fortified cereals is here is because that's going to help you get things like vitamin A, vitamin D, help you get some of those nutrients. And then nuts and seeds, not in their whole form, but something like a smooth nut butter or a seed butter. So how can nutrition be utilized in the management of IBD if we're not active? So we're in more of a remissive state and we're trying to um, manage those symptoms. Definitely want to have ample intake to man maintain our weight. So we've been able to achieve usual body weight or a stable weight. So we want to make sure we're getting in enough intake. You want to include protein-rich foods, foods that contain calcium, Omega-3 rich foods for that uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Same thing for antioxidants. Enough fluids to prevent dehydration. And minimally processed foods. We want to make sure that we're trying to avoid those processed refined sugars and starches, saturated fats, caffeine, and alcohol. And then lactose and gluten, and specifically with gluten, wheat. So they're synonymous with each other because wheat contains the gluten proteins. But wheat is something that we find with our IBD patients can definitely promote that inflammatory response. This is individualized, and I always work with my patients that this is not a black and white, and the same is true with lactose. This is not black and white. This should be gray and something that we work together to see what's most appropriate for you. Proteins, again, this could be those high bioavailable proteins, meaning they have all of the amino acids that we as humans can't make ourselves. Calcium-rich foods, this doesn't have to come from dairy, so if you don't eat dairy as a personal preference or you don't tolerate dairy, we could also get this from things like tofu and eggs and fish and dark leafy greens, nuts and beans. High omega-3, that could come from fatty fish, nuts, seeds, could also come from things like algae and seaweed, 
could also come from things like fortified foods like eggs. Specifically, you'd have to purchase an omega-3 egg. Or it could come from things like milks or beverages uh, like soy. And then all of those antioxidant foods. We want to make sure that we're getting in tons of vitamin C through fruits and vegetables, vitamin E through things like nuts or avocados or seeds, carotenoids through all of our fruits and vegetables, things like brightly colored fruits, uh, pumpkin, tomatoes, watermelon, selenium. We want to make sure we're getting this in through our foods. Brazil nuts are a wonderful source of selenium. One or two of those a day, you wouldn't be surprised, you would be so surprised how much of selenium you're getting. Fish and shellfish, zinc, uh, beef and oysters are a wonderful source of this, but you can also get this from chickpeas and lentils. So for those of us that follow more of a plant-based diet, we can still get zinc. And phenolic compounds, things like apples or blueberries, grapes. So in summary, when we're active and inflamed, we want to make sure we're decreasing the amount and type of fiber, focusing more on soluble versus insoluble fiber. Dairy products certainly can remain unless they're not tolerated, and we may want to choose lactose-free. Small frequent meals to help reduce the energy expenditure and making sure that we're reducing inflammatory response. Enough fluids to avoid dehydration supplementation to make sure that we are repleting any losses and making sure that we're preventing losses. There is consideration of reduction of those high fermentable foods. And then we may need to do a combination of solid foods and liquid foods to help you get in enough dietary intake because all of that solid food in a day just may be too taxing for an individual. The same could be true with someone who is in remissive state or very well-managed state of IBD. Consider small frequent meals versus three large meals per day. Focusing on a well-balanced, nutrient-rich diet. Intake of natural sources of pre- and probiotics. So all of those wonderful, rich, insoluble, insoluble foods are going to give you all of those uh, prebiotics. And probiotics are going to be those wonderful fermented foods, things like yogurts, fermented vegetables. And then consumption of whole grains, variety of fruits and vegetables, if they are not triggering of your symptoms. Enough fluids to avoid dehydration. And then supplementation. So usually I'm recommending a multivitamin, but again, this is not a black and white. It's a very gray area depending on my patients and their tolerance. So a few resources here for you for finding dietitians or information for nutrition. Lots of resources here if you're interested in reading. And then I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thank you.